Lately, I've been focusing on the vital topic of refuge. This is a traditional topic in traditions around the world. For example, in Buddhism, the three classic refuges or jewels uh, are described as the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, uh, or what could be understood as the teacher, the teachings, and the community of the taught, including the inner teacher, potentially. And we find in other traditions, we find in modern psychology, and we find in practical life, the importance of places or activities or other people, the importance of memories, the importance of ideas, the importance of feelings that give us a sense of sanctuary, thus refuge, a sense of sanctuary, protection, rest, and renewal. Sort of like the oases, or if you like, the pit stops uh, in the long and twisty road of life. These are refuges. And the weirder the world gets, <laughs> the more the winds are howling around you, the less other people are helping, the more important it is to find refuges of various kinds. I'm going to use this broad topic of refuge as a way both to explore uh, the classic refuges of the teacher, the teachings, and the taught, and relate that in interesting ways, I think, to the refuges of the three classic psychological strengths of inner calm, inner contentment, and inner peace. And you can see some of the ways that those might relate to the classic refuges of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha in Buddhism. That's an exploration. So tonight, I'd like to talk with you about taking refuge in what we can value in other people what we can internalize, what we can stabilize inside ourselves from other people, and in effect, walk in their footsteps, whoever they may be, which has very interesting implications for our relationship with our own parents. I am a therapist, <laughs> you are warned. Uh, and our relationship with teachers that, we may, that we've had who may have also had feet of clay, perhaps, while also having a lot to offer? How do we take refuge in other people in ways that are clear-eyed and take into account the total mosaic, all the tiles of who those people are, including the people we grew up with? It's a very rich topic here. So I want to begin by just telling a story about uh, one of the refuges I found for myself when I went off to college. I was 16 when I started at UCLA, really shy, incredibly clueless, awkward, socially inept, uh, painfully self-conscious person. And somehow I found the courage toward uh, the spring of uh, 1970, amidst all the changes and troubles sweeping across America at that time, I found it inside myself to run for president of my dormitory. Dykstra Hall at UCLA, which had 800 people in it and a fair amount of money to spend in student government. So it was actually a significant thing. And it was certainly a significant thing for me to stick my neck out in that way. And at the ripe age of 17, somehow they voted me in. And there I found myself, whoa, whoa, what do I do now? And so I began to watch the assistant dean Carol Hetrick, wherever you are today, Carol, thank you and bless you. I began to observe how Carol was with other people. She seemed so wise and so old, and she might have been 28, I don't know, maybe 24. I think she had a master's degree in something or other, and she was an assistant dean at UCLA. And I would watch her in meetings or interact with other people or managing conflict or managing me and the trouble I was causing her with my you know, big ideas and grand schemes for uh, making things better in, in our dormitory. And she was so skillful. She would just say the right word, or she would say no word at all. And somehow it all worked. With my you know, intellect, I guess, I would deconstruct what she did or figure it out or rewind the movie. And it would take me about five minutes <laughs> I would gradually understand why she did what she did and why I was effective. By that point, everything had moved on you know, to the next thing. But over time, in a sense, I would ask myself, what would Carol do? How would she say it? And I began to increasingly kind of study and emulate what was going on inside her own mind. You know, the attitudes, 
the ways that she would lose certain points in order to gain ground in more important ways. She'd lose battles to win the war. I, I began to understand how she could retain compassion for other people who were maybe kind of aggravating while seeing the usefulness in at least something they were saying and finding a way to join with that and then move on. And more and more, I just kind of felt like, okay, I was almost channeling Carol in some down-to-earth kind of sense so that slowly, painfully slowly in some ways, I began to become more skillful myself. This is the process that psychologists call social learning, in which, to some extent deliberately, we can study others. What would they do? We can try to adopt some of their nuances or style or a word they might use, a distinction they might make. And also, more fundamentally, we internalize in our own bodies their posture, their stance, their attitudes, in some ways even their ground of being, just their vibe, their energy. You know, we, we get it. And this is a deeply important aspect of human developmental psychology. In other words, as when we're born, very quickly, we are trying to become uh, in rapport with and attuned to our primary caregivers because certainly in terms of um, human evolution and the ways in which most humans have ever lived, right, in hunter-gatherer bands, um, certainly most of our ancestors ever lived in hunter-gatherer bands, um, it, it's a matter of life and death for an infant or toddler or preschooler to internalize their caregivers and learn to become increasingly like them in various ways and over time become discerning about what to take in and what to nod to but say no thanks to. The problem is for a young child, there's a tendency toward all or nothing. So we entirely take them in or we entirely reject them. And this quality in us to kind of polarize things into either or, right? Up or down, left or right. That tendency to polarize things can, in adulthood, involve what's called a kind of splitting in which we tend to see someone as either entirely good or entirely bad, or we see ourselves as entirely good or entirely bad, and we lack the capacity for healthy ambivalence. A child's acquisition of healthy ambivalence, being able to see their parent as a complex figure with some good parts, some bad parts, some neutral parts, and a lot of complexity. This capacity to recognize complexity in others is a major developmental accomplishment. It enables us to internalize what is helpful and wholesome, admirable, skillful, valuable, to internalize those parts while leaving the rest. And this capacity to recognize what is good in those we are modeling and internalizing so that we can take refuge in that which we take into ourselves while leaving the rest is a fundamental skill if we are to take refuge in the example of other people and in what we internalize of other people. So to make this kind of concrete and real, and noting also that I'm quite happy to respond to questions or comments that come in the chat, to make this concrete or real, think about someone in your life who has had a quality in them, which might be a, a very sweeping and significant characteristic that they have, some quality in them that has been important for you to emulate, to take into yourself, and, and to make your own. So I'll pause here for a breath or two while you reflect on that. With, for example, Carol Hetrick, um, I would say one of the things I really internalized from her was her, was her sense of kind of calm, self-respecting goodwill for others. She wasn't giving up her point of view while 
being calm and benevolent, really, toward other people in very skillful ways. Now, that was something I really tried to begin to take in through her example. So for you, could be a teacher, could be a friend. You know, you've got a friend who just has this quality you've really taken in over time. Could be a spiritual figure, could be a, could be a presence that feels transpersonal somehow. What's one thing that you've tried to internalize in which you can take refuge today? It might be the same quality that you have found in multiple people. And to keep it concrete and not abstract, it might help to think about just one being. And can you give yourself the gift right now of knowing that this is present in you, this quality? is present in you. You might still be developing it. You might need to remember to draw upon it. And still, ah, you can give yourself the gift of recognizing that this quality really is in you. It's a relief isn't it? To know that it's in you. It landed. <laughs> the package arrived. <laughs> you can open it up and enjoy it. It's in you. Now, if we could, a little more challenging. <clears throat> Think about someone, and it could be the same someone, that in the broad sense, there's some ambivalence about. In other words, what I mean by that is that you see them as the whole package and, you know, with maybe a wart or two. One, call it red tile in the mosaic of who this person is. So. Can you help yourself? It could be a parent even. Think to yourself, okay, I really value and internalize something good about them while also recognizing that there are other parts that I don't want to take in and make my own. I'll give you a little example of my own father, no longer alive. Um, he had a fundamental fair-mindedness about others and decency. He was a profoundly fair-minded person. Uh, I think that was a quality also that supported him as a scientist, a kind of objectivity and balance. And he could get really kind of pressured and uptight when he was barbecuing. <laughs> and kind of critical and intense and resentful that nobody else was helping, but he wouldn't let anybody help. <laughs> I'm trying not to internalize too much of that. While also internalizing is, is, is really wonderful fair-mindedness with all kinds of people. So I'll be quiet here for some breaths as you try to help yourself, know what it's like with someone maybe who's been important to you, it could be a, it could be a, it could be a parent, that you have um, you know, an appreciation for one quality while also discerning that there's another quality that you don't want to you know, live from. 
So I'll be quiet for some moments here. and getting a sense of the positive quality inside yourself. It's here in you. Well, also, Recognizing that you have the right to establish a kind of boundary or a differentiation in which you say, no, I don't want to live from that other thing. Maybe a tendency of, toward it is inside you, but you don't want to feed it for sure. And maybe it will gradually wither away through lack of reinforcement. Well, meanwhile, you can appreciate this quality you've taken in, even from someone who perhaps was difficult for you. I'm seeing some wonderful comments coming in through the chat where people are sharing personal examples, including of parents. There's, and you can let yourself feel the freeing. There's a freeing in knowing that you can take in this <laughs> while leaving out that, or at least not feeding that and identifying with that and letting it gradually fade or wither, or at least be compartmentalized. There's a, there's a relief in knowing this. And then taking another step as Ole anticipated and called out, you can do this with yourself. Commonly, people, me included, are painfully aware of their own foibles and failings. Meanwhile, through social media, we're surrounded by the highlight reels of everybody else's wonderful, moral, virtuous, saving the world life. And um, so, you know, we cannot see ourselves as a mosaic. Can you right now recognize some positive quality in yourself? Maybe something you've already reflected on here, but a positive quality in yourself. While also recognizing, oh, okay, off to the side, there's something else. Maybe you're working on that something else. It's there. But here, you know, there's a really good quality. So I'll set the table myself. Um, particularly when I'm trying to get stuff done and I'm kind of quick and there's some activation of the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system a little revved up. I can get a little impatient if I'm obstructed or quite impatient, it can arise. And that's something that I, I'm not trying to feed or reinforce or identify with. I'm trying to disengage from it and gradually ease it so it doesn't arrive at all. So that's, that's true, that's true. My wife will nod, yep, that's true. <laughs> and alongside it is another quality in that I come to a soft landing pretty quickly, and it's very much my intent to come to a soft landing quickly of calm and flow and ease with others and a willingness to admit it or cop to it that I got impatient. 
How about you? What's something in you that you can appreciate about yourself and, and trust in yourself? While also recognizing that maybe there's another part of you that is a work in progress. In other words, it can be a, re a relief to know that you can take refuge in your good qualities, even if there are other things, old habits, tendencies, temperament, that you know you're dealing with. It's like appreciating the flowers and the fruit they bear in your garden, while also knowing that there's some weeds. The weeds do not make the flowers disappear. We can be, in a sense, ambivalent about ourselves. We can see ourselves as a whole while taking refuge um, in the many good qualities. And now I'd like to apply this to the Buddha and to other teachers that you may have had. I've had many teachers along the way, and some of the teachers who had the most positive influence on me were also the most flawed, which is really interesting. And I'm not saying that their flaws were necessary um, for their gifts to occur, but it is interesting and for me honest to acknowledge that many of the people some that had the greatest influence on me beneficially, particularly when I was younger, had some real issues. <laughs> so I want to read a footnote here from my book, Neurodharma, which has many wonderful reference notes in the back. This is about the Buddha's own life story, own life story. And um, in some of the weeks to come, what I'd like to do is explore some of the uh, really useful examples from his own life story as best we understand it, as we explore the refuge of the teacher, including the teacher within. And uh, I also want to draw upon other voices from early Buddhism, particularly the very first uh, women monastics whose poetry and writings have come down to us over many, many centuries, really remarkable women. And um, I think it's really important and useful to be aware of and reflect upon examples, exemplars, models who are unlike oneself and to, to really broaden and, and appreciate uh, the, the full diversity of those we can, we can draw upon and, and take into ourselves. So um, I was writing in this section of the book about the bliss of blamelessness and the, the Buddha's teachings with his own son. Rahula is the name of his son. And there's a kind of famous episode in which Rahula, the son, was caught lying. He had become a young monk, uh, Rahula had, and maybe eight or nine years old, and he had told a falsehood, and, and his dad, the Buddha, was <laughs> confronting him about it. And essentially, the Buddha taught Rahula right there, hey, um, with regard to what you're thinking and what you're saying and what you're doing, before you act, ask yourself, is this for the welfare of others and myself, or will this lead to suffering and harm? And if it's for the welfare of others and yourself, okay, do it. Then while doing it, ask yourself, is this thought, this word, this deed helpful or harmful? If it's helpful, okay, keep doing it. And then after doing it, reflect, ask yourself, huh, was that worthy? Was that something that actually led to happiness and, and welfare or to suffering and harm? And based on what you uh, recognize and reflect upon, then you know, change, your, change your behavior accordingly. So here we have the Buddha giving a moral teaching, and still in his own life, there was a significant backstory, including with his own son. 
uh, that you may know already. And so I'll read you this little footnote, in which I said, there is a significant backstory to this teaching with his son. As best we know, the man who became the Buddha grew up in northern India roughly 2,500 years ago. When he was 29 or so, his wife, Yasodhara, gave birth to their first child and their only child, Rahula. And about this time, the, the man who became known as the Buddha, let's call him Siddhartha at that point, Siddhartha left home. He left his baby. He left his wife. He left to become a wandering ascetic. No way around it, the Buddha's path of practice began with leaving his family. We can consider this in terms of both our modern standards and the norms of his own time. I see him as someone who struggled and made choices, and this humanizes and enriches my sense of his teachings. Now, we might consider that after the Buddha became enlightened, if we think of him in that way, in, in the Buddhist definition of full awakening, full awakening, no longer is that a mind that's at all capable of hatred or aversion, greed and grasping, or the sense of self, or any kind of delusion. So maybe after that awakening, uh, the Buddha lived in an entirely moral way, while also, interestingly, as he taught one of his followers, who apparently was a serial killer of the time, who tried to kill the Buddha too, and he became converted to the Buddha's path, uh, and um, this uh, serial killer named Angulimala was confronted by various villagers later on for being a bad person, and Angulimala came to the Buddha and said, hey, I've, I've, I'm, I've taken up robes, I'm a monk, I'm not killing anymore, why are they throwing dirt at me and other things? And the Buddha said, well, you may have converted yourself to a better way of being, but you still have to deal with the consequences of your previous actions. So maybe that applied to the Buddha as well. In any case, we have a complex history here. So what do we do? Do we throw out what we might find of value in the teachings uh, because we, under, we know something of the patriarchal and um, self-centered um, backstory here of uh, the man who became the Buddha? Uh, or can we, can we separate the one from the other and continue to see what's useful and valuable while recognizing everything else? In much the same way, can we do this with people in our own lives, the people we live with, the people we raise, the people who raised us? Can we see them in complex ways and maintain our capacity to rest in the refuge of what is genuinely, in our view, genuinely worthy in them, including perhaps our own parents, while also disentangling ourselves from and disengaging from those parts of these, those people, those aspects of those people that we don't like or don't appreciate or think are in fact really morally flawed. Can we do that? Can we help ourselves with the developmental accomplishment of seeing complexity, seeing complexity? and taking refuge in what is worthy and wholesome and beneficial while disentangling from the rest. Including the mosaic of our own being and the complexity of our own being. So uh, with that as a frame, and as a frame for an exploration I'll, I'll walk you through, the next week or two or three of the Buddha's own um, journey to awakening and what the very human and practical lessons are uh, for the rest of us from that. I want to open it up here um, for any comments or reflections from other people that I'll, I'll take in the chat. I'll read them quickly here. Uh, and um, maybe they're, you know, I'll, I'll respond to as well. Okay. 
And then let's see, maybe also there might be someone who has a comment here. So you can see the comments that others have made. For me, I can just say, it's been incredibly freeing to realize, oh, <laughs> it's like a meal, you know? It's a weird analogy, but we're all a buffet. <laughs> I'm a buffet, you're a buffet, my wife's a buffet, my son and daughter are a buffet, people are a buffet. My parents are like a buffet, right, with many dishes, many dishes. And there's some we like, there's some that are interesting, but not exactly what we wanna eat every day. Some that are, eh, okay, but they don't really do it for us. Others are like, what were they thinking, right? <laughs> what was the cook doing? People are a buffet. And it's incredibly freeing to realize that, you know, I can agree with this. I don't have to agree with all that. I can reserve judgment about this. I can wholly embrace that. I can like that about you and think to myself, wow, I'd like to have a little more of that in my own mind while the rest of it, no thank you. Wow, that's wonderful. That's so freeing, okay? So let's see here. Um, I'm just gonna see if there's any comment or question. Da, da, da. Right, so I'm gonna bring up something that came to me privately, but it's, I think it's a very general question. So what do we do when there's a person in our life, it could be a significant person, a parent, a lover, a partner, a life partner, it could be a business partner. I've had my own experiences of this sort of thing, who does something that's a shocking betrayal. And it could well be that what they did in that tile or cluster of tiles in the mosaic of who they are is so much that we're just done. We never want to see them again. Hopefully we try to eventually get to a place of compassion and inner peace with regard to that person, but still we're kind of done. The question is, does that betrayal, that evil deed, does that somehow erase everything else? Now, there's a natural tendency in us to generalize and it's cognitively efficient. It's a very useful way to survive in the Stone Age or back in Jurassic Park to just kind of generalize, to globalize, to it's called essentialize. So if that person did, you know, a bad thing, they are globally bad. Right? We we globalize. That's a very natural tendency. The problem is when we do that, we forgive the metaphor, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We, we lose touch with all that was good. And this can be very wrenching. There are a number of examples these days that are very public in numerous quarters where major teachers um, have been revealed to have also been a drunk uh, or, or a sexual predator or both. And, um, you know, this is a shocking kind of event for people and it can feel like it invalidates everything else. It's very understandable. That said, what's good for you, right? What's good for you? Whatever they are, they're dealing with their own karmas in this life, if not lives to come. What's good for you? It may well, in your judgment, be good for you to stay in touch with and to continue to appreciate what you have learned from that person, what you gained from that person, the good times you did have with that person, the love you did receive from that person, the respectable, admirable qualities even from that person, the doors they opened for you, the experiences they helped you have. To appreciate that and not invalidate that or feel that it's tainted because it's not inherently tainted. It's not inherently tainted. And we can disentangle it gradually. Sometimes it can take years to really process what happened. Sometimes it can take decades if the wound, if the betrayal was deep and far reaching with someone who is extremely important to us, like a parent. But gradually over time, we really can tease these apart 
and preserve refuge for ourselves in what is useful. You know, the sweet amidst the bitter that we can continue to taste and, and hold close to our heart. So I want to see if there's another comment or question. And then um, let's see. Aha, very important question Teresa asks. It really gets to the heart of the matter and a, and a kind of, I think, confusion in, in some teachings. Teresa makes the comment, is it judgmental to call someone flawed? Well, I can just tell you right up top, I am flawed. <laughs> really? <laughs> so you're not being judgmental if you were to call me flawed. You're actually being discerning. You know, I have flaws. I have stuff I'm working on. I'm not, in my view, stabilized in full enlightenment, to put it a certain kind of a way. And um, so we can be discerning, right? We can see the mosaic. We can see the totality of the person. Um, we, can, we can be discerning. We can see facts as we see them. We recognize that, you know, our view is fallible and we're learning and blah, blah, blah. But it's not that everybody has their own reality. No. You know, let's say that teacher really did molest, usually, it's always a man, usually always, um, his students. It happened. It's real. It wasn't that both sides to it or, you know, it's like, no, it really happened. It's not like shape of the earth. Opinions differ. <laughs> you know, it really did happen. We discern. And we also have values. We relate the facts as we perceive them, as we recognize them, as we come to understand them gradually as what they really are. We relate them to certain values. And in terms of those values, we judge. And there's a place for that. I judge people who feed children as better than people who make children hungry through their policies or personal actions. We judge. We judge ourselves. We, we think there's something more skillful or less skillful, more harmful or less harmful. That's really okay in my view. And um, in terms of what Teresa brings up here, we might well be wrong. That's why it's important to be careful in our discernment and not get too attached to our views. Uh, the four primary objects of attachment in Buddhist psychology that get us into trouble are attachments to pleasures and attachments to resisting pain, first. Second, we get attached to various routines, could be called rites and rituals. We get attached to the sense of self, my precious, right? And we can get attached to our views, our views. And attachment to view is something to be very careful about, especially if, you know, part of what you do for a living is to generate useful ideas or take some things, like myself. So yes, that's true. We have to be careful about our attachment to view. On the other hand, um, we have to start somewhere, right? And it's okay to see what we see and value what we value and plan what we plan. Um, and I think that there's a kind of misunderstanding somehow that because of the at ultimate reality, you know, it's it's all one. There are no distinctions. There are no values there. It just is what it is. Still, down here on planet Earth, we have a life to live. And we cannot live without seeing what we see, valuing what we value, and planning what we plan. Okay. I want to see if there's a person who has a hand up. I'm just going to scroll through the screens. If you do have a question, please make it related to what I'm talking about here and keep it succinct, okay? So I can end at half past the hour. Anybody want to say something? Anybody? I'm looking for a hand. Did I see a hand waving there? Did I see Judith's hand? Judith Ein in Watsonville. So I have to do a little thing here really quickly. Bear with me. I'm going to mute all, but I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. Please don't, unless you're Judith in Watsonville. And Judith, I'm unmuting you. Judith, you're unmuted. Yeah, what's your question or comment? Well, my question um, has to do with um, that sort of like dealing with a history of having been sexually exploited by a series of teachers mm. and 
the process of getting to that. I guess that's. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. I'll speak to that a bit. Um, right off the top, I'm just, I'm really sorry about that. And uh, obviously, and second, that's never happened to me. I've known numerous people, unfortunately, to whom it's happened. And what they describe is the importance of giving oneself room to breathe and, and time and connecting, if it's helpful, with others who've had similar experiences. And there's a natural process, I think, that that has kind of stages to it, or more it's like spiraling. Sometimes it, it moves back through you know, familiar spaces, but perhaps at a deeper level. You know, there's a deeper healing gradually over time, that part. And I think it's really important to, uh, in a way, not blame ourselves, to really appreciate in that situation. Um, I myself was in what I would call half a cult, and it was stunning to me as a stubborn, determined, self-directed person how much I was sucked in. We're profoundly social animals, and it's very often the best in us that's, that sucks us in, that, that traps us or causes us to take, you know, to blame ourselves or to take responsibility over here rather than recognizing that actually we're being exploited by other people who are not treating us as a thou, but in fact are treating us as a means to their own ends, as if we are in some ways a kind of it. So, you know, it, it's, it's very powerful. It's, we, sometimes when we get out of those situations, we blame ourselves, like, oh, how could I have let that happen? But in fact, it's really understandable how it can happen. And I think bringing compassion to ourselves about it is supremely important. Um, as I finish here about a very large topic, I know there are books about this, there are resources about this, there are, there are networks that are related to this kind of issue that are, I think, important to draw upon. Um, I'll just, um, if I could, just in the interest of time, finish by saying that um, it's important to appreciate that whatever is the case about them, they did not get to or destroy the core of our being. That what is good inside us remains. What the truth that we open to remains. The, whether it's contacting ultimate reality, whether it's the cultivation of certain qualities, all of that really is intact. And the, those people, they got to deal with their own consequences over there. But we over here, and here's where I'm speaking really quite personally, may draw upon a certain moxie, a certain, you know, defiance, a kind of defiance that says, uh, I think, you know, as Maya Angelou, to paraphrase her, I believe, put it, you know, my experiences, um, she put it very eloquently, they, they are about me, but they do not define me. I am more than that. And there's a kind of, for me, beautiful freedom and defiance that says, shame on you. But me, I'm still here. And the good in me and the, and the good that I've grown in me is still intact. And if you're like me, you may throw in a few swear words along the way. <laughs> as you move on and put more daylight, one day at a time, one breath at a time, between yourself and that train wreck. Okay. So let's sit together, if we can, thank you, Judith, for a minute here, just in quiet with each other. I'm not gonna unmute you all. We're not gonna do the kind of chaos of uh, waving at each other unless you wanna wave at each other silently. Let's just sit together quietly in a sacred kind of way, finding refuge in what is indestructible. Refuge in what is good.
refuge in what we've learned and how we've grown. And if you like finding refuge in each other, fellow practitioners around the world, with us tonight, maybe with us at other times. I take refuge in you. We can take refuge in each other.